Good afternoon and welcome to this Chemistry World webinar. I'm Ben Balsler, Chemistry World's digital editor. Now, there are plenty of you registered for today, but there's loads of room, so come on in, take a seat, get comfortable, and we're going to spend an hour looking at the science of what's possible with waters, who today have helped us to find a topic because they see firsthand the trends in speciality measurement, so they know the things that are going to be important in the future. In particular, they're looking at the future role of lignins and how you can gain more detailed insight into your lignin samples. Now, I'll tell you a bit more about the webinar itself in just a minute, but first of all, let me introduce the GoToWebinar software that we're using and importantly, how you can use that to ask any questions that you have at any point throughout the webinar. So the GoToWebinar panel should be on one side of your screen uh, that you can use to control putting your hand up, for example, if you uh, need our attention. Uh, you can send us a message in the questions box there, or if you have any questions for our speaker at any point, just type your question in there and we will make sure that we get to them after the presentation a bit later on. So what's that presentation going to be about? Well, by the end of this webinar, you're going to understand the value of lignin analysis in order to effectively introduce the biopolymer into your utilization streams. You're going to understand how to gain insight into the possibilities and limitations of working with lignins, which, as I've said, are going to be so important for tomorrow's circular economy, and how to leverage the benefits of advanced polymer chromatography, we'll probably call that APC from here on in, to increase sample throughput using classic approaches. Now I've already alluded to this but our partners for today's webinar is Waters and they really have uh, pulled out all of the stops to help us find the right topics and the right people to speak to. And our speaker today is Antje Potthast who is from the, the Institute of Chemistry of Renewable Resources at Boku University in Vienna, Austria. Now Antje has more than 20 years of experience in chemistry and analysis of lignocellulose so she's exactly the right person to talk to. Now there are Still some people coming in so we'll just before we get into the presentation we'll let everybody get comfortable but let's run a poll I think so let's find out a little bit more about you so hopefully the next thing you'll see on the screen will be a uh, poll some questions so what primary analytical technology do you currently use in your analysis now we're just going to give you uh, a few seconds maybe 30 seconds or so in order to tick which of those boxes is the primary one you may use more than one but if so pick the one that's most important to you so as I said a few more people have come in so for those people who have just arrived a little bit late we're delighted that you're here uh, the most important thing you need to know is to sit back enjoy the presentation but if you have any questions at any point throughout the webinar then you can just type them into the questions box in the go to webinar panel and we will put them to Antje as we get uh, towards the second half of the uh, webinar itself after the presentation if for whatever reason you are unable to stay for the entire thing then not to worry we will be making a recording of this available and we will email that to everybody who's registered there's also also a certificate of attendance for everybody who was actually here during the live webinar that will arrive in an email over the course of the next few days so that's probably long enough for you to get your poll results in so let's have a look and see what primary analysis you are mostly using that's a really even spread except for the uh, the poor cousin there at 2dlc chromatography which apparently nobody is using there's a good range of different uh, techniques there let's bring our speaker in now aren't you, is this the sort of thing you expect to see from quite a large audience of chemists using quite a broad variety of techniques Yes, hello, good <clears throat> afternoon, everyone. It looks interesting, 22% for GPC, so that, that is really perfect. Liquid chromatography, mass spec, everything there. So <clears throat> I think we are all set for um, the lignin analysis because Excellent. all three things we will <laughs> basically need there. And there will be a little bit of everything uh, in the presentation as well. There we go. Well, speaking of the presentation, uh, just so that everybody at home is aware, we have uh, we've pre-recorded this presentation to make sure that we could fit everything in. There's a lot to learn in an hour, and we wanted to make sure we still had time for all of your questions. So what we're going to do now is we're going to roll the video of Anja's presentation, and then we will come back to you at the end of that. So any questions you have at any point, drop them into that question box, and we'll open the floodgates of questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Thank you again, Anja. Let's roll the video.
Good afternoon, everyone from Vienna, and welcome to our session on the analysis of the molar mass distribution of technical lignans. Before we talk about analytical details, I would like to start with a brief introduction to lignin, and in particular to technical lignans, and explain briefly why this biopolymer attracts more attention just recently, and why it becomes more and more important to thoroughly characterize lignans. In the main part, I will focus on the way to analyze molar mass distributions of lignans and how we can add some speed to that process with the water's advanced polymer chromatography. Eventually, I will show you also one example for the analysis of fragments of lignin after, for instance, depolymerization reactions by convergent chromatography coupled to mass spec like QTOF. So let's start with lignin. The word lignin originates from the Latin word lignum, which simply means wood. After cellulose, lignin is the second most abundant biopolymer on Earth, and it accounts for as much as 30% of the organic carbon in our biosphere. Lignin developed in plants once life moved from the aquatic environments to land. That means practically no lignin is found in the sea apart from a few exceptions. Lignin waterproofs the cell wall, which allows transport of water through the vascular system of a plant, but is also <clears throat> um, important in protecting the cell wall from invasion of pathogens. It gives plants the necessary mechanical strength and stiffness, which is needed for terrestrial life. Lignin differs from most other biopolymers as it is not constitutionally well defined. It's a racemic mixture induced through biosynthesis with a natural very high complexity. Already in the plant, lignin is chemically and structurally very, very heterogeneous. The basic lignin building blocks are formed through biosynthesis following the shikimic acid pathway. In trees, lignin is formed from mainly three phenylpropane units, which are shown here. Uh, recently, it was shown that lignin biosynthesis is very malleable and other building blocks have to be considered as well. The polymer is formed by a random radical polymerization process, which is induced by enzymes like lacases or peroxidases, which are present in the cell wall. The outcome of this radical polymerization process is shown here in a very recent model for hardwood and for softwood lignin. The degree of branching and cross-linking is still a bit a matter of debate. The links between the building blocks are mainly ether and carbon-carbon bonds, which render the lignin overall very stable. Among others, aliphatic and aromatic hydroxy groups are an important reactive functional group um, in lignin. Within the cell wall, the lignin is added mainly to the secondary layer, as shown in this model. And here it's closely related to um, hemicellulose, and the hemicellulose then of course also to the cellulose. So why is lignin of such an interest today? Worldwide, about 70 million tons of technical lignans are produced every year by the pulp and paper industry. That's a pretty decent number for a regrowing sustainable polymer. We can consider this as the largest natural source of aromatics, but we use only 1-2% to of what is generated in technical process. Um, those pulping processes of wood um, are performed in order to uh, produce cellulose, um, which is used then for paper, fibers or derivatives. In that process, lignin is separated from cellulose and hemicellulose, and 98% of that lignin, which ends up um, as so-called black liquor, see that down here, this black liquor, um, is used um, as fuel to run this rather energy-intensive process of pulping. The main reason why lignin has recently returned to global focus is the new bioeconomy strategy. Here it plays an important role as a carbon source. 
while we can generate energy also by wind, solar or water, we rely on carbon when we want to produce materials or chemicals. Currently we use fossil oil for most of these products, but when we want to really implement a circular economy, we need a sustainable carbon source and lignin is a good candidate because we already generate large amounts of it. This is one reason why the number of lignin patterns is tremendously increased in recent years, what you can see here on the slide, but compared to that numbers we see only few applications on the market. And here the quality of lignin and how this can be assessed comes into play. Lignin is a natural product and as such it is prone to already natural variability and this in particular applies to lignin as you could see already in biosynthesis. Even more so changes in the raw material extend all the way to the final lignin products. But this is not the only complication with lignin. What makes it even more tricky is an additional more or less drastic change brought about by the process which generates the technical lignans we have currently available in such large quantities. Um, such a process is for instance graft pulping. While we already have a good understanding of the native um, lignin structure, um, we still pretty much struggle with the structure of the technical lignans. The harsh conditions, extreme pH, high temperatures for several hours which are applied in most pulping processes um, change the native lignin structure. Of course many structural features are retained but new ones are formed, condensation reactions do occur and some unknown features are in that technical lignans we have only a rather limited understanding of today. The different technical processes result also in different types of lignin which sometimes have very different properties. In terms of analysis this means we either have to find a system where we can analyze them together or we have to use different uh, systems with different conditions. A major concern for uh, analytical people uh, is usually the solubility. Um, craft lignans usually dissolve under alkaline conditions while lignosulfonates are water soluble. Uh, some organosulf lignans on the other hand can be directly dissolved in organic solvents. In today's presentation I will mainly focus on the two most important technical lignans which is craft lignin and lignosulfonate. Those two types of technical lignans are also lignans which are available in larger volumes. Craft lignin is partially degraded compared to the natural variant. It contains about 2 to 3 percent sulfur and it comes in different degrees of purities depending on the precipitation and subsequent purification treatments. Major impurities are ash and carbohydrates as well as extractives. Every lignin is UV active, uh, UV maximum is usually around 280 nanometers and the specific feature of craft lignin is its strong fluorescence which um, makes it sometimes troublesome in some analysis techniques uh, like light scattering. The lignosulfonates on the other hand contain sulfonic acid groups which render the whole lignin structure water soluble, uh, more or less at all pH levels. The molar mass is generally higher compared to the graft lignans. Um, also lignosulfonates can show fluorescence, uh, but this fluorescence is at a much lower intensity level compared to that of craft lignans. In order to comprehensively analyze lignans, one method is usually not enough as for many other polymers and we have to perform a whole set of techniques to cover functional groups, byproducts and also molar mass. So in the following I would like to concentrate only on the molar mass of lignin and uh, as this is a very important property of the biopolymer and it also is important in uh, future applications. As said, molar mass is a parameter which is decisive for structure property relationships. Lignin is dispersed with regard to individual chain length, but also with respect to branching, functional group composition and group or charge. That means within a technical lignin those structural features are not homogeneously distributed over the whole molar mass distribution, which also may complicate the analysis. In literature and in research labs all over the world, many different methods are currently in place to measure molar mass distributions of lignin. 
so far no real standard method is in place. I will briefly comment on the different variants available and their pros and cons. For technical lignans we basically have two choices. Either try to dissolve them as they are in a general solvent like sodium hydroxide or DMSO, or increase the solubility and with that also the choice of solvents by an additional derivatization step. What method a lab chooses depends on the in the first place on whether only a single type of technical lignin has to be measured, like just craft lignans, or really different type have to be analyzed like craft or and also to get out lignosulfonates. Sodium hydroxide is a good solvent, but it has some issues with scaling and also some lignans seem to be less stable in that system. In any case, it would also work for lignosulfonates. Derivatization by acetylation or acetobromination is very popular in lignin sec. It largely increases the solubility of technical lignans, but not always renders all lignans perfectly soluble. It cannot be applied to lignosulfonates. An important issue is that the overall molar mass of the lignin molecule is changed by the derivatization step, which uses the free aliphatic and aromatic hydroxy groups in lignin. Depending on the number of those hydroxy groups, the molar mass alters. If just a relative comparison is performed, um, this is not a critical issue for measurements towards more absolute data and comparisons between different samples which are very different, uh, this may be a problem. Often groups do the derivatization for other reasons, like NMR measurements anyway. In such a case, a molar mass analysis of the better soluble acetylated samples is useful. If we don't want to change the polymer molar mass by derivatization, we have to opt for a direct dissolution in a suitable solvent. This can be DMSO, which solubilizes most of the craft and organosulf lignans, and with a little trick, also lignosulfonates. Lignosulfonates in the salt form are not soluble in DMSO directly, but if the sulfonic acid groups are protonated, for instance by a cation exchange resin, they are fully soluble in a solvent. The same applies of course to polystyrene sulfonate uh, standard compounds, which usually do not dissolve if not protonated. If we have to analyze very different types of lignans, DMSO is a rather universal approach. Addition of a salt, for instance lithium bromide, helps to prevent aggregations. We usually use DMSO with 0.5% lithium bromide as the element for our sec. The solvent system, as I said, is universal, but like with other solvents, we have the problem that our runtime is rather long with 65 minutes. To use less columns, in our case we have a set of three columns, is not an option as we also need a good resolution. If we want to increase the speed, we would have to increase the flow. But this leads to higher pressure and eventually to a collapse of our gel particles in the column filling. Those gels are simply not made for higher pressure, especially in classic GPC, um, we are very limited in speed. In, our, in order to solve this problem, we have to change the column material. So we have to change the whole chemistry of the column material. So here the Waters VH technology comes into play. Ethylene bridged hybrids uh, particles are the key behind the high pressure technology for UPLC, but also for the advanced polymer chromatography, which is the size exclusion chromatography equivalent. We apply for lignin the equity APC XT um, types, which are packed with a high coverage trimethylsililsilan bonded to BH. These columns work at extended temperature and also in organic solvents. With a stability of up to 1200 bar, we now have a completely different situation for size exclusion chromatography. The equity APC XT columns are available in a range which is suitable for the molar mass determination of lignin and lignin can also stand the high shear forces due to the much higher pressure so it doesn't degrade in the analysis which is a bit more problematic for larger polymers like cellulose for instance. So the initial question when we started this was whether lignin can be analyzed on an APC system 
um, and can our lignin analysis really benefit from um, that system in any way? What we expect from APC is of course a gain in speed and resolution, but we also had to consider some other questions. If we take THF as a typical solvent for APC, we need to derivatize to render the lignin sufficiently soluble. This would destroy the idea on a much higher speed in analysis. If we consider a direct solvent like DMSO, we have severe issues with the high pressure, which leads to freezing and solidification of the solvent already in the pump head. So we simply tested different options and different technical lignans and started in the first place with acetylated samples in THF. The chromatographic system consisted of an equity APC with an isocratic pump, sample manager, which was set at 60 degrees, and the column uh, manager set at 90 degrees. We analyzed the concentration of lignin using a UV, and as mentioned before, the column set tested was the equity XT. Here we varied the column set depending on the respective lignin samples, as you will see in a minute. The first solvent tested was THF with a flow of 0.8 mL per minute, and we applied polystyrene standards. You can see them alluding here on a set of three columns within seven minutes, uh, all the way down to 1,250 Daltons. The corresponding calibration line is nice and flat, which indicates also a very good resolution in that system. This is something we had expected. When we inject an acetylated lignin, we have the elution profile here on top and the molar mass distribution based on the polystyrene calibration below. The molar mass distribution looks very similar um, to what we are used to from our other methods and the resolution separation from the salt peak is really good. So we can state that acetylated lignans in THF can be easily analyzed with run times well below 10 minutes with a very good resolution. For the acetylated lignans tested in THF, we found no signs of enthalpic interactions, like adsorption, um, with a tremendous gain in analysis speed. So if you anyway happen to have acetylated or acetopromenated lignans in your lab, the application of APC leads to a very fast separation with really good resolution. But if you need to acetylate the samples just for sec, um, this is not necessarily an option as the acetylation or acetopromination as an additional time consuming step. So any gain in speed in the chromatographic step is basically lost. Hence we did test DMSO, so direct dissolution, and whether this would work to measure technical lignin samples um, also. As I already mentioned briefly, um, here we have to consider that due to the melting point of DMSO, the eluent can freeze out directly in the pump head and of course then the pump stops working. This is indeed the case for pure DMSO. The addition of lesium bromide, in our case 0.5%, prevents this by a freezing point depression. So in connection with the salt, DMSO can be applied also in high pressure sec like APC. Other solvents work similarly in connection with the salt. However, for technical lignans, for instance, the use of uh, DMF uh, did not work so well in our hands at least. For the DMSO lesium bromide system, we have tested different column combinations. Available are 45, 125, 200 and 450 angstrom versions. It is possible to connect all four even with the DMSO lesium bromide system. The full set is necessary for separation of lignosulfonates, which are considerably larger in molar mass compared to craft lignins. Um, and here we need the larger pore volumes for a decent separation in the high molar mass range, especially here, you can see that. So the a set of three columns is not enough for the lignosulfonate, but it's perfectly fine for craft lignans like indoline, which you can see here. If we use all four columns, um, this results in a runtime of, of nine minutes. 
This would be also the method of choice for lignosulfonates. For graft lignans, we can optimize the system by just using the 45, 125 and 200 angstrom columns, um, where we have a sufficient resolution and a total runtime of about 6.5 minutes. Um, and if you remember, we had a 65 minutes in a normal sex system. So this is a tenfold gain in analysis speed compared to our ordinary GPC. As for the calibration with PSS standards, we have a very similar behavior compared to the classical version, the comparison you see here. Again, it should be noted that PSS standards are soluble in DMSO irregardless of their molar mass when a protonation step of the sulfonic acid group is performed before the solution so you can do that by an exchange uh, resin treatment. The illusion profiles for GPC and APC are shown here. Uh, we have very similar chromatograms. The measurement is very reproducible. And uh, since we see the same molar mass distribution in this very different column systems, with different column chemistry, we can safely assume that we have no problems with um, enthalpic interactions, adsorption, something like this, um, which quite often happens uh, in technical lignin samples, especially in those which are not very pure. So in conclusion, we can say that we obtain a tremendous gain in speed, which is about tenfold for Kraft and organosulf lignans, and about eightfold for lignosulfonates, and we have uh, the same or a better resolution for the APC system. If you need tips or tricks uh, for the Waters Empower software, uh, there is a very useful blog on the Waters homepage. I just put it here, so if you have specific questions, you can also refer to that page. For technical lignans, um, we are unfortunately missing appropriate standard compounds for molar mass calibration. Um, this is a problem which exists independent on the type of separation. So we have that problem in GPC, we have the same problem in APC. Um, shown here is a lignin model here, um, where you see definitely um, a location in the calibration range which is off from our, from our polystyrene standards. So the polystyrene standards um, have a different hydrodynamic radius compared to our lignin molecule. So for the polystyrene standard calibration we will definitely make a mistake uh, because we have this clear mismatch in hydrodynamic radii. In order to get around this problem light scattering detection can be applied and this can be done also to APC for technical lignans. The difficulty of using light scattering for absolute molar mass analysis uh, in combination with lignin is the very strong fluorescence um, which comes especially from technical lignans and here in particular from craft lignans and that very strong fluorescence disturbs the measurement um, very drastically and in many cases a measurement is not even possible. A solution to this issue is if we shift the laser wavelength towards the infrared region where lignans have a lot less fluorescence. Together with filters and some other software related and hardware related tricks, we can measure absolute molar mass data also for craft lignans. Since the APC system has a flow in the range of an ordinary sec, the light scattering detection and the mulch cell design um, work also in connection with APC. And an example is given here on the right side um, for organosolf lignin. The MALS mass uh, data are here and they are perfectly nice. So this is the absolute measurement of the molar mass. Um, and this is the chromatogram for, for this organosolf lignans. It was just one column in that case. And a collaboration of waters and also of the Wyatt Corporation um, in, in that um, issue uh, basically 
allows for easy connection and operation of APC with absolute molar mass um, detection by light scattering. Last but not least, I would like to show you one more example of analysis of a degraded lignin. For lignin utilization, we have currently different scenarios. Either we use the lignin in the polymeric form and uh, choose the type based on its polymeric characteristics for a certain application. A second variant um, is to partially separate the lignin into different polymeric fractions, high molar mass fractions, low molar mass fractions. We can do that either by um, molar mass separations like ultrafiltration or by polarity, so using different solvents. Or in a third version, we can strongly degrade or depolymerize the technical lignin into smaller fragments. And of course, we also need to analyze those fragments. And um, one nice example is basically given here with the application of convergent chromatography, the UPC square, which applies supercritical carbon dioxide as the solvent together with a modifier. This ultra-performance convergent chromatography system, the UPC square, can be coupled to a number of different detection systems and very powerful, of course, is a direct connections to a QTOF MS system. And this has been previously described by Holterberg and co-workers and also by the Turner Group. Uh, both are from Sweden and the literature is given down here. The separation power um, for lignin fragments um, in the UPC square um, is very good. Uh, we have a very high speed, um, as we can see here. So separation is done below uh, seven minutes. So this brings me already to the summary of our webinar on lignin. I hope I could show you that lignin will be an integral part of our future biorefinery scenarios and that we need comprehensive lignin characterization methods, which also allow a certain sample throughput, a certain higher sample throughput. The application of APC, so of advanced polymer chromatography, is a very nice way to speed up the analysis of molar mass distribution of those technical lignins. APC works for different types of lignins with different solvent um, and can be easily coupled to even light scattering detection modes. I'm pretty sure that we will see more applications also for the UPC square coupled to different detection systems um, for analysis of lignin degradation products. Finally, I would like to thank our um, postdocs, Dr. Rina Sulayeva and Dr. Grigory Zinoviev from Boku. And I would also like to thank um, the people from Waters, Dr. Jean-Michel Blanquele, um, from Paris and also Dr. Faltilo Ferse from Berlin. Without them, um, these developments would have not been possible. Thank you very much for your kind attention and feel free to ask questions, to type in questions and we will be here and try to answer those. Thank you very much. very much. That was a, a, a very in-depth uh, walk through all of the issues around uh, lignin analysis. Clearly, it's a subject where there's a great deal to learn, a lot of its own very specific issues that need to be dealt with. And it's also one of those wonderful examples where academics at a, a university work very closely with instrument developers to make sure that we're getting the techniques that we need now, we are going to open up for questions in just a second, but first of all, let's uh, find out a little bit more about you, our keen audience. So let's roll another poll. And here we go. How important is method development in your lignin analysis? So again, just pick one of these. Is it critical? Is it very important? Is it just somewhat important? Or is it not important at all and you're just here to enjoy the presentation? So uh, we'll give you a short while to fill in some of those. And just a reminder as well, as I said, that was a, an in-depth walk through the entire science around this. So if you wanted to go back and watch that again, we will be making the recording available. People often ask us if we're happy to share slides. 
we feel that the important thing is, is not just the content of the slides, but the combination of the slides and the presentations being given. So rather than sharing the slides, we would direct you and encourage you to go back and watch the video again, uh, just to watch in a little bit more detail, pick up those things that you may have missed the first time round. So uh, we'll still leave that up for a little bit longer while I remind you that there is that questions box. We've already got a couple in, but any more questions you want to put in, just type them into that questions box right away and we will get through them uh, as quickly as we possibly can. That's probably enough time for the poll now, so we're going to close that down and see uh, what the distribution is like. Okay, so again, there's a reasonable distribution here. There are a relatively few of you for whom uh, method development is critical, but a lot of you for whom it's very important. Uh, and yeah, again, thank you ever so much for pre-recording the presentation. It was wonderfully clear, very concise. Uh, is this the sort of thing you'd expect to see that the, the majority of this audience are, are in the sort of very important up to critical area? Yeah, I think what we see here is um, that Lignin still um, needs a lot of development. So there's very few ready-made um, methods out there which are like plug and play. So I think for, for most people, they still have to invest some time, but maybe in a couple of years um, that would look different and we had um, more things available already like um from literature which is um directly applicable and we don't have to worry about massive development but at the moment in the stage we are now i think um it's it's pretty much what we also seen that we have still to invest time and money into massive development to get optimal results that leads me actually very neatly on to uh, a question that we had right at the very beginning of the presentation from John Liu, uh, who said that you know, lignin has been an, an academic topic for 70 years. It's still a hot topic now. Um, what's new about what you've been able to show us today? What are the more recent developments that we can now take advantage of? Yeah, I think um, we are we have to look into technical lignans, which is a little bit more tricky, but those are the lignans we will um, we will use in the future for whatever applications. Um, and of course, we have totally different methods nowadays, so we have a lot more um, possibilities, um, but still lignan is very, very tricky. So even though if you have the chance to apply those new methods, we are constantly learning. Um, learning new structural features maybe sometimes, especially in technical lignans, um, trying to cope with that color, with the sulfur and byproducts. So um, especially with the technical lignans where we have a very, very wide variety. Um, and sometimes we are facing methods from the 50s and from the 60s still, um, I think that is the big challenge. So we have to convert that to something high throughput, high accuracy. Um, so, so that will be something we probably um, are facing at the moment and which will help us to bring lignin into applications. I think this is, um, it's interesting that it's not just academic in terms of um, we are analyzing lignans, but we also have to make the step into applications. And I think there is a little bit of bottleneck at the moment. I guess to an extent as well, we, we don't always know the questions that we need to ask. And as we find that our demand for a circular economy and our demand for biorefineries that, that, that use lignans as a, a source, for example, the more we know that we need to do, the more questions we discover that we need to ask. And so the more techniques we need to develop in order to answer those questions. Yes, that, that's exactly right. So um, in, in lignin chemistry, um, you solve one thing and it opens up five other new questions you have to cope with. <laughs> so I think it, that's quite normal also for other fields, but um, for, for lignin, um, that, that's certainly very true at the moment. So we do have a few more questions coming in. Let me have a look. Uh, we've got one from Mariam Arefmanesh, uh, who says, have you measured the absolute molar mass of lignin from the Kraft Ligno Boost process uh, using these techniques? So uh, for people who aren't familiar, uh, 
craft lignins are, are essentially reconstituted, aren't they, from wood pulp rather than taking a, a, a pure natural wood source. You, you To create a craft lignin product, you reconstitute that from wood pulp. And that, of course, is going to, because it's had various different applications applied to it, will give you a slightly different chemical profile. Yes. So craft lignin is basically the lignin we are, uh, which ha we, we have most of available uh, at the moment. So that's why it's so interesting. And <clears throat> craft lignins are the most tricky to uh, be measured in uh, absolute measurements with um, light scattering, but we have done it. So it's possible to analyze craft lignins with a 785 nanometer laser, where you can suppress the um, fluorescence um, of this craft lignin. And this is also true for the Ligno Boost. And yes, we have measured it also for the Ligno Boost. Um, this um, 785 nanometer laser together with filters um, gives you a very strong reduction, but it, you still have a little bit of fluorescence and in addition absorption. And those two processes um, go basically uh, against each other. So with absorption, you measure less molar mass and with fluorescence, you overestimate. Um, you can basically correct for both. Um, and the trick basically is that you look at um, the uh, calibration line in the, in the mouse and the light scattering. And there you see that um, there is strong fluorescence in the low molar mass range. And there is basically no fluorescence at that wavelength in the high molar mass range. And um, with the Wyatt system, you also have a chance to uh, correct for the absorption um, by using the forward laser monitor as a reference, as an internal reference. And then you can basically extrapolate down from the non-fluorescent high molar mass uh, over the whole range. And by that, you get an absolute number for graft lignin, which is roughly two times higher, so two times what you measure with the polystyrene standards. So it's definitely higher. It depends a little bit what type of Ligno Boost you have, but um, I would say for a uh, softwood Ligno Boost, it's two times higher than what we measure with our polystyrene sulfonate standards. So I hope this answers this question. We've had a couple of other questions about uh, craft lignins as well, but I think I'm going to move away from that for now. So, uh, Marina, really excellent questions, but I think we'll just move away from now. We will send these on. So, if if there is anything that we that we can say for you, we'll try and get those sent over. Um, we've had a question: Can a GPC differentiate between soft and hard wood lignins? And that's a question from Ara uh, Jacknavorian. Um, so, I guess this is a, an important thing when you're looking at the source of lignins, you need to be able to differentiate between what the original wood was. Is this something we can use these techniques for? Uh, no, a GPC can basically not differentiate between uh, softwood and hardwood. Although what um, usually is the case that um, hardwood craft lignin, for instance, is usually or has a smaller overall molar mass um, or MW, smaller overall molar mass distribution compared to a softwood. But in principle, no, you cannot um, distinguish um, whether you have a softwood or a hardwood lignin, not with GPC. And uh, speaking of the, perhaps the, the restrictions of the, uh, the approach that we've got here, uh, Shubhanka Bhattachara asks if molar mass of lignin is actually a good parameter for the comparison of different types of lignin, because they're different compounds, different properties. Is molar mass really telling us enough or are we using it just to learn very specific things? Yeah, I mean, molar mass is one out of many parameters, but I think it's it's a very important one. Um, and if you compare lignans um, for applications, the molar mass is critical. Um, just imagine you go in the application uh, via a dissolution in a reagent or in a solvent, um, then you can basically, with the molar mass distribution, predict the viscosity behavior in that solvent. And quite often, that is um, a bottleneck. Either it's too viscose or... So many, many of those um, applications um, 
have issues with viscosity, for instance. So for that, it's it's very interesting. It's also good because with um, certain setups, you can also judge a little bit um, whether you have uh, residual polysaccharides um, in your lignin as an impurity. And although we have rather small amounts of those polysaccharides, they may play a role in applications. So small amounts of xylan, for instance, um, um, show up in the rather high molar mass um, range of the distribution because the xylan is still, um, compared to a graft lignin, a little bit on a high molar mass side. Um, and here, that even though if it's in small amounts only present, it may affect your um, your application quite a bit. It has a lot of OH groups, so reactivity might be affected, um, but also viscosity. And um, for instance, if you have a light scattering and the combination of RI and UV signals, uh, you can judge um, how much um, polysaccharides are in there. You cannot quantify them, but you see if there is another um, non-lignin polymer in there, and this sometimes is important um, or is important information in general. So um, there's a lot you can basically get from a simple molar mass distribution, but of course you still need to measure your functional groups and, and uh, other things in lignin. We've had uh, a very nice question from Charles Rono, who says, uh, I see most of the chromatograms have two peaks, a major broad peak and a shoulder sharp peak. Could you explain what that means for us? Yeah, um, honestly, I don't want to speculate what the sharp peak is. It could be a degradation product, which is not monomeric. So we are still in a low molar mass, but still polymeric area. Uh, it's definitely lignin. Um, but I cannot tell exactly what it is. So you see with a good resolution, you separate some of those um, lower molar mass fractions or lower, low molar mass um, components there. Um, but you have to be very, very careful when you have peaks and shoulders in the molar mass distribution, because sometimes you think you have a good resolution, but what you in fact have is an enthalpic interaction, just like an adsorption, which um, then generates an artifact um, in form of a shoulder, which is actually not really present in your lignin. In the present case, as I said in the, in, in the video, um, we are confident that this is real because we have two very different systems with very two different materials. So, uh, it's not an artifact, but I cannot tell you exactly what it is. We never separated that one out. Um, it could even be um, extractives at least present in, in that smaller peak, but the total amount of extractives is much lower. So weight-wise, um, this is <clears throat> not enough to be just the extractives. So honestly, we don't know exactly what it is. Thank you very much. Hopefully, Charles, that will have answered your question for you. We've had a, a few questions about the, uh, the issue around uh, using higher pressure and so on. So Marina and Solin asked if uh, injector temperature can help prevent or can uh, you know, can can affect the uh, the glutination that leads to higher pressure in the injection system. Is that something we can look at? Higher temperature uh, in the injection system or in general, because we are already running at pretty high temperature um, to keep down the viscosity a little bit. Um, so uh, well, I Mar mm -hmm. Marina, Marina has very quickly got back to us to say in general, so the, the whole system. Yeah, the whole system um, for the APC system already runs at, um, at rather high temperature. Um, so we tested this a little bit and found this to be the optimum conditions for, for the lignin separation. Um, but a uh, little lower temperature is also possible. Um, it's at a certain point you have to stick to 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 conditions, and this basically would be optimized. 
Thank you very much. And thank you, Marina, for uh, getting back to us so quickly with that clarification. Uh, let's uh, see if we can move away a little bit from the method and more into the application. So we have had a question from uh, Jithu Joseph, who asks, uh, what sorts of applications are we looking at for the you know, oligomeric products from lignans? Where should we be looking at for the future? For the oligomeric products? Um, That's his, his specific question. But I think we can also broaden that out in general with lignin mm -hmm. products. Yeah, in general, you have the possibility to, um, if you degrade um, the lignin into oligomers, monomers, um, that you eventually can use them as drop-in chemicals in existing systems. Um, this is tricky in a way that lignin monomers, oligomers are um, very diverse. So we have really, really different um, um, materials there. We saw it in, in the UPC square uh, separation, so many, many different types. Um, <clears throat> but um, eventually, if you're just looking for uh, phenolic OH groups, um, they usually have them, of course, naturally, then we can use them where we um, need basically a phenol or something. And this is, at the moment, I think the most promising uh, application is to use lignin um, as a substitute for, for instance, phenol or polyol in binders for um, uh, different um, applications in, in the woodworking industry. MDF boards, um, plywood, that is a very typical, also a very classic application to substitute phenols. And um, I think in the meantime, this, this is something which works quite well. So. Uh, depends a little bit always on the price of the phenol, um, whether this is competitive, but here um, we have some sort of a larger scale applications already. Um, but there is a lot in the pipeline uh, and I hope we see um, more um, of whatever applications. I personally prefer basically to apply lignin as a polymer, so not degraded. Uh, kind of acknowledge a little bit the synthesis effort of nature um, but whatever can be done i think um, we have to check out and, and try and i guess as the commercial demand grows for a more circular economy we're going to be looking at uh, reusing wood and extracting for, for that phenol source rather than looking at a, a, a petrochemical source for example uh, we've got a question from we're, we're starting to run out of time now a question from jose luis sanchez uh, who asks how he can identify the kind of technical lignin that he's got and therefore what type of analysis he should use mm -hmm. um, if you get an unknown lignin, um, good choice is NMR, HSQC NMR. Um, you see basically the SG ratio in NMR quite nicely, so you can see whether you have a softwood or a hardwood. Um, if, if you don't know whether you have a lignosulfonate or a craft lignin, of course, solubility tests will tell you immediately. So lignosulfonate is water-soluble, craft lignin is usually not water-soluble. Um, so NMR, um, you can do, depending on what you have available, methoxy group um, uh, determination. Um, again, this tells you softwood, hardwood. Um, you can look at the um, carbohydrates, for instance, by a methanolysis. Um, but here, interestingly, uh, softwood craft lignin mainly contains xylan not the glucomanan, which is the more abundant hemicellulose in softwoods. Um, the reason is that in the black liquor, where you usually um, precipitate the lignin out, the xylan, which is a little bit more acidic because of the glucuronic acid groups, um, is better soluble. So it ends up more in the lignin. Um, so usually um, you need one or two analysis techniques to figure out what you have. I see. Thank you very much. Hopefully that will answer Jose's question. Um, we've got one here from Kenneth Day. He says the focus at the moment seems to be largely on craft lignin due to its abundance. Is organosolve a more desirable thing to be looking at? Should we be focusing on developing economic methods for extracting non-sulfonated lignin? Yes. Um, 
I mean, the reason why we have this large focus on organosulf, um, uh, on, on graft lignin and also on lignosulfonates is um, the graft lignin is there in very, very large quantities, at least in the form of black liquor and already also um, as um, isolated lignin um, from the lignin boost, for instance. And the lignosulfonate anyway already has some sort of um, um, history of, of utilization. For the organosulf, we have the huge advantage that we have no sulfur. So that makes it very attractive for applications where sulfur is a problem and sulfur is a problem, especially in craft lignin. So um, that would uh, really be something where we would opt for organosulf lignin. And it would be nice to see more. At the moment, it's mainly pilot scale uh, size applications. Um, but we see sometimes in applications that organosulf lignans behave um, quite nicely compared to other lignans. Um, in any case, it would be nice to have that as a third option in a larger quantity. So eventually we will probably have an application and then choose the right lignin um, in the best case without any modification, but choose the right lignin from a portfolio of lignans available on the market and then use this one and here if we would have more organosols that would be super nice thank you for that question kenneth hopefully that answers it certainly sounds like we're waiting to see which of these pilot scale things will prove to be truly scalable we've got less than five minutes left so let's see if we can squeeze in a couple more questions um we talked about uh using phenol from lignin uh, and Mertkan Otzel has asked uh, how can we do a phenolic content analysis of lignin do you have any suggestions yes um phenolic content analysis uh there you have different options um one option is uh, phosphorus NMR. Um, here you uh, react the, the lignin with a phosphorylating reagent, um, which basically attaches to aliphatic OH groups, phenolic OH groups, and acidic groups, carboxyl groups. And then you run a phosphorus NMR, and here you can basically quantify those different groups um, separately. So <clears throat> that is a, a, a nice method to do that. Uh, it's not the high throughput method though. So if you opting for high throughput, there is very little available at the moment. You can also do a simple acetylation. So you acetylate all OH groups, uh, aliphatic and aromatic, and run a proton NMR. And here you can basically also separate the acid fuel groups attached to the phenolic OH groups and also to the aliphatic OH groups. And you can quantify those. Um, so there are options available and phenolic OH groups or both phenolic and aliphatic are one of the main structural features uh, which determine basically um, a lot of the uh, reactivity, although the reactivity is relative. So reactivity only can be defined if you know the uh, respective application. So you have to know reactive in terms of what. But phenolic aliphatic OH groups are certainly really important and there are methods out there. Uh, we are currently working on a high speed method for, for those um, structural features, hopefully um, available soon. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, let's see if we can squeeze one more in. This is from my own notes. Um, lignins, as we know, they tend to arrive as, as a mixture, all sorts of different things in there. How much do carbohydrate impurities affect your measurements? Um, carbohydrate impurities are usually always there. They're some, sometimes a little bit neglected. Um, they, in the first place, affect solubility. So if your lignin is not very um, soluble, it can sometimes be, it's not because of the lignin itself, it's because of the carbohydrate impurity. And here, um, the DMSO system is kind of nice because DMSO lisopromide is known also to dissolve the carbohydrate fraction. Or you can basically measure um, hemicelluloses in DMSO as well. So this little hemicellulose parts uh, which you have in, in the lignin fraction as impurity um, readily dissolves also in DMSO and that's uh, why the DMSO system is sometimes a little better than other solvents like DMF for instance. And then, of course, it 
um, with a sec malt system you can basically see this carbohydrates if you have um, reasonable amounts also in, in, the, in the GPC malt system. Fantastic. Thank you for squeezing that question in. We are basically now out of time. I'd like to say a huge thank you to Waters who helped uh, find the topic, find the uh, the correct presenter. And I'd like to say an, an enormous thank you to Andrea Potthast, who is a professor from the Institute of Chemistry of Renewable Resources at Boku University in Vienna. Thank you, Andrea, for joining us. And thank you to everybody who submitted your brilliant questions. I'm sorry we didn't have time to get through all of them. Some of them are really very specific as well, but we'll try and send all of those on to our presenter. And if she is able to help, then I'm sure she'd be delighted. So as I've said, we will make a recording of this available. If you'd like to go back and watch any of it again, that will arrive in your inbox shortly, along with the certificate of attendance for everybody who is able to join us live. Chemistry World does a range of different webinars. Do keep an eye on chemistryworld.com slash webinars for upcoming topics that you think you might be interested in. If you're not already a registered reader of Chemistry World, please do sign up. You can get our daily, weekly or monthly newsletters, as well as access to the latest chemistry news, research, opinions, and features and reviews from across the chemical sciences. I'm Ben Valsler, Chemistry World's digital editor, and I look forward to seeing you in another Chemistry World webinar. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much.